good evening one and all what a fantastic evening today i am excited super happy to be part of this wonderful webinar which is being organized by cci current controversies in asthma management generally i am excited but today i am super excited the reason being two re important reasons we are doing this webinar on behalf of on the uh, significance of celebrating world asthma day and world this is this month may is the world asthma month so on this occasion i profusely thank our um, moderator come speaker today none other than the stalwart of obstructive airway disease management in india or else we can call him as dronacharya because his efforts past three decades have revolutionized the way that we practice because he trained hundreds and hundreds of pulmonologists thousands and thousands of pft technicians he is none other than our dr sandeep salvi welcome to this webinar sir we are cci is blessed honored privilege to do this webinar with you thank you sir thank you so much and sir doesn't need any introduction but to be brief sir is director of palmo care research and education foundation that is pure foundation from pune and um, he is a member of board of directors for gold guidelines and at this outset i profusely thank uh, dr n h krishnana who is uh, another stalwart in management of uh, asthma for the past close to more than two two decades uh, and uh, he is the chairman trustee of cci for giving this opportunity for all of us and other team members core members dr n h um, dr narayan pradeepa dr atri dr ravi doshi and uh, dr kirat dr shivani dr narendra mithku everyone is consistently playing a vital role in dissemination of this asthma care in india and i now welcome um, dr s jayraman good friend mm -hmm. and uh, i can say he is one of my oldest friend here since i uh, i did my observership in 2005 in apollo chennai so dr jayna jayraman is senior consultant pulmonologist from apollo first med hospital i think pune malle road and uh, mgm healthcare chennai thank you welcome thank you. welcome dr jayraman thank you sir thank you good evening next to dr ajay lanjewar he is associate professor dattamega institute of medical sciences from nagpur great friend of mine and is a purely academician welcome dr ajay to this webinar and another good friend of mine though senior okay he behaves you know, with all the junior colleagues very friendly dr pramod jawar consultant chest physician and uh, sleep breathing disorder specialist is a director of jawar chest uh, center indoor and consultant chest physician at geeta bhavan hospital and a bronchoscopist at the same hospital indoor welcome dr pramod sir welcome and without wasting much time today next probably dr sandeep may take uh, approximately 40 45 minutes in uh, discussing uh, in delivering a talk on controversies in management of uh, asthma and uh, with an intent to this year's theme closing gaps in asthma care 
and uh, Gina has come out with a brilliant concept this year, closing all the gaps, whatever the loopholes that are available. We as a clinicians, we as a physicians, pulmonologists, we must uh, take a lead and then uh, try to um, manage asthma in a better way than ever before. And uh, with this short intro, I would love to invite Dr. Sandeep Salvi, sir, to uh, deliver his talk on controversies in current asthma care. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Wish you all a very good evening and welcome uh, to this today's uh, evening symposium on controversies associated with asthma. I am Dr. Sandeep Salvi, the director of the Palmocare Research and Education Foundation situated in the city of Pune in India. Uh, at the outset, I would like to express my very sincere thanks and gratitude uh, to the Chess Council of India for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, some very important and interesting uh, knowledge about asthma uh, that would be very useful and applicable for uh, all the doctors who are attending this. 3rd May 2020 was uh, recognized as the World Asthma Day for this year. And the whole objective of uh, the World Asthma Day is to create awareness uh, share whatever new knowledge is available about asthma amongst our fellow colleagues as well as the lay people and uh, help reduce the burden and the suffering that is associated with asthma. What I'm going to, going to do today over the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to share with you some very interesting and important controversies that have been associated with asthma right from the beginning. And uh, as I take you through the journey, I'm sure there'll be a lot of learning for uh, students of uh, postgraduate students of respiratory medicine, as well as uh, practicing physicians uh, to help them uh, improve their knowledge base. And also, uh, uh, you know, a lot of practices that are associated with asthma currently uh, are not correct. And hopefully this talk will also help them improve the quality of care. So let me start by sh uh, showing you the very first slide. And uh, we know that asthma as a disease was described about 5,000 years ago. And uh, although the name asthma was not uh, clearly mentioned, but there are descriptions that clearly suggest that uh, these were conditions of asthma, uh, noisy breathing, shortness of breath, and uh, a cough which uh, we all know are very classical symptoms associated with uh, asthma. At that point of time, asthma was believed to be caused by demons, spirits, unhappy gods and foreign gods 5,000 years ago. And because that was the belief uh, that was responsible for asthma, the treatments were also quite obvious that if you want to cure yourself of asthma, you would offer sacrifices, you would burn incense in the temples, and you would also drink uh, owl's blood, uh, which was believed to be uh, useful to get rid of uh, demons and spirits. Not only that, but people also were advised to eat excreta of camels and horses and crocodiles as the treatment for this condition. So you can see how beliefs gave rise to uh, solutions, which today we would obviously call them as uh, absurd. But this was 5,000 years ago. The word asthma was actually coined for the first time by Hippocrates. And this was about 3,000 years ago. And uh, he classified asthma as one of the severities of breathlessness. So mild asthma was called as dyspnea, moderate asthma was called as, moderate breathlessness was called as asthma, and severe breathlessness was called as orthopnea. So based on the severity of breathlessness, asthma fell into the middle category. Those who had moderate breathlessness were called as asthmatics. And he believed that asthma was caused primarily 
not by the foreign gods and the demons and the spirits and all that nothing to do with that for the first time uh, uh, over a period of around 2000 years he said nothing to do with foreign gods or nothing to do with demons uh, it is because of the environment cold weather moisture what we call as increasing humidity would cause a disequilibrium of the body humors now mind you uh, anatomy was not well known at that time so human bodies were not dissected so whatever uh, you could observe was purely through uh, speculation and he believed that the body was made up of different types of important humors and that an evil humor was produced in the brain and that evil humor came through the cerebrum plate of ethmoid went into the nose and from there it it went into the chest and that was what was responsible for causing the symptoms of breathlessness that he called as asthma so big shift from the understanding that we had 5000 years ago but because he believed that this was the cause for asthma the treatment was to get rid of that evil humor coming from the brain and he said that the only way to do that was to take incisions on the skin and allow the blood to come out let the let the let the human body bleed and then you you would remove say about 100 200 or 300 milliliters of blood and uh, he said that is the treatment for asthma blood letting and i believe there are quite a few places in india or uh, in the world where this is still followed as a treatment for asthma where you remove blood from the body and believe that the evil humor has gone along with that not until 1900 when the first autopsy was done in a patient who died of asthma that was the very first time we actually got an insight into what happens in the lungs of these asthmatic patients because until then there was no knowledge at all what is happening inside and a histopathological examination in a dead asthmatic patient showed that these are the features that happen mucus gland hypertrophy hyper secretion of mucus the lumen is loaded with mucus presence of mast cells and eosinophils release of histamine from uh, from the mast cells and other mediators also were released and there was smooth muscle hypertrophy became big smooth muscles were big in the uh, bronchial mucosa and subsequently at the same time uh, spirometers were developed peak flow meters were developed and that actually gave us a physiological insight into what happens in the lungs the airways get narrowed and it was believed that the airways get narrowed because of the smooth muscle contraction uh, of the in the airways now because uh, of these observations from histopathology and uh, physiology uh, the treatment obviously was based on that so if there is smooth muscle spasm uh, the treatment for asthma was bronchodilators relieve the smooth muscle spasm there's a lot of histamine that is released in the airways Uh, so antihistamines were recommended as a treatment for asthma mast cell stabilizers uh, that do not allow the mast cells to release the mediators were also a very very common treatment for asthma in fact i remember my mother who suffered with asthma used to take a drug called disodium chromoglycate which was a very good drug that uh, stabilized the mast cells and prevented it from releasing all the mediators uh, this was during the 1980s and uh, so this was the treatment that was recommended for asthma based on histopathological examination and uh, lung physiological tools uh, henry hyde salter from the united kingdom uh, was the first person who actually classically described the pathology of asthma and he said that asthma is a disease of only the smooth muscles where the smooth muscles contract excessively and the treatment for that was only to release to relax the smooth muscles and that would relieve uh, the symptoms associated with asthma many of you may perhaps not uh, know this but the thura stramonium uh, uh, the the dried leaves of this plant uh, was uh, burnt and then the smoke that came out was inhaled in china uh, uh, in the early 1900s and uh, when the british came to india they saw the indian people in chennai uh I'm sorry if i said china but in chennai uh that this was a very effective smoke from the datura leaves that immediately gave you relief from uh, bronchospasm 
and uh, subsequently the chemical that was isolated was acetylcholine and then you got infratropium and then subsequently tritropium so an anticholinergic drug the history comes from uh, chennai and uh, you know, subsequent the, the the britishers also you know they used to make a powder of the dried leaves of the datura leaf datura plant <coughs> put them in a cigarette light it and they smoke it uh, these were called as asthma cigarettes which contained the dried leaves of datura and you were actually inhaling uh the anticholinergic inside your lungs and you were getting immense relief uh from the bronchospasm so popular was it that the british took this to uh the uk and from there they sold these asthma cigarettes that contained uh the datura leaves uh, dry powder now subsequent to that a lot of pharmacology was also developed and apart from anticholinergics and they started understanding uh the adrenergic receptors then they realized that adrenaline has an effect on both alpha and the beta receptors and it was the beta adrenergic receptors uh, which on uh, stimulation cause bronchial smooth muscle relaxation so adrenaline isoprenaline and then subsequently salbutamol developed and or evolved as a pharmacotherapy for patients of asthma and then salbutamol was later uh, developed in the form of an inhaler by glaxo smith kline in 1969 so the first inhaler for uh, asthma using salbutamol was in 1969 in 1951 uh, the adrenaline inhaler was developed and that was the first inhalation therapy that started but 1969 you got the salbutamol which was pure beta adrenergic it didn't have any effect on the alpha adrenergic receptors and therefore became very popular uh, the inhaled salbutamol Uh, then became the standard for treatment uh, for asthma, and uh, doctors used to prescribe uh, salbutamol inhaler, two puffs to be taken three times a day on a regular basis to get relief of your asthma symptoms. Something happened uh, in the uh, late nineteen eighties. Uh, two very important reports from New Zealand showed. that patients who used regular salbutamol or regular beta 2 adrenergic uh, inhaled medication uh, the mortality rate suddenly increased and as you can see here in the left side of the graph over here from 1920 to 1980 1980 was a sudden peak in asthma deaths and people were really worried <clears throat> why are so many people of asthma dying uh, because uh, of the treatment that they were receiving and on the right hand side you can see that uh, let me put my pointer over here i hope the pointer is uh, going to be visible to you but this is again 1975 to 1990 so during 1980s phenoterol uh, was a short acting uh, beta 2 adrenergic agonist just like salbutamol that was marketed in new zealand and you can see that when the phenoterol sales increased the the deaths due to asthma were very high peaked around 1980 and when people started realizing that it is perhaps the asthma medication that was giving rise to the asthma deaths uh, phenoterol was withdrawn from the market in uh, the late 1980s and as the drug was withdrawn as you can see over here the asthma deaths suddenly plummeted to almost uh, close to baseline now that was a very important study that showed that regular use of beta adrenergic agonists was not the appropriate treatment for asthma late 80s and early 1990s and there was a recommendation following these two important studies that all asthmatic patients must stop taking regular short acting bronchodilators uh and they should only use it as and when required late 1980s 1990s I don't know how many of you all still prescribe a short-acting bronchodilator as the only treatment for a asthma patient. If you're doing that, you're actually causing more asthma deaths uh, in in your practice. So I think uh, this was a very very important message that came in nineteen uh, late nineteen eighties, uh, and that was a recommendation that as as I just said. Uh, the other thing that people realized was here is a healthy airway with a nice lumen. in an asthmatic patient there is smooth muscle bronchospasm the lumen becomes small you give them a bronchodilator the lumen expands 
the patient gets relief and I, after the end of the action of the bronchodilator the patient goes back into the bronchospasm phase again you give, you give a bronchodilator the smooth muscles relax and and so on so that keeps on happening until uh, the smooth muscles you know contract relax contract relax just like your skeletal muscles over here and when that happens contraction followed by relaxation multiple times the muscle becomes hypertrophic so even the skeletal muscles if you want to make them big you need to contract and relax uh, with the resistance and that exactly what happens or happened in the asthmatic airways that gave rise to smooth muscle hypertrophy which then increased the bronchial hyperresponsiveness and caused more bronchospasm with time as you gave them more and more short acting bronchodilators so this was the likely mechanism of how <clears throat> short acting bronchodilators actually cause asthma deaths one of the characteristic hallmark features of uh, asthma is uh, is bronchial hyperresponsiveness classically can be seen by this plant called uh, touch me not or mimosa pudica you just touch one leaflet and the whole thing starts shrinking exactly the same thing happens in the smooth muscles in the airways an irritant comes in cold air comes in the smooth muscles contract all over the lung uh, exactly what happens uh, just like this plant uh, many people like to describe asthma as a personality disorder of the airways uh, where the smooth muscles become very hypersensitive they become panicky in nature they don't want anything to enter inside the lung uh, which they believe the smooth muscles believe is going to cause damage to the alveoli so that's why the smooth muscles become hypersensitive hyperresponsive and cause bronchospasm and these are the triggering factors for bronchial hyperresponsiveness cold air dry air environmental irritants like pollutants allergens or sometimes even change in the electrical charge in the air uh, as uh, what we see during a cloudy weather very classical triggering factors for bronchial uh, hyperresponsiveness other than that there are quite a few drugs that can cause bronchial hyperresponsiveness like histamine methacolin manitol use of beta blockers and as i said use of short acting beta agonists or even long acting beta agonists for that matter which will increase uh, bronchial hyperresponsiveness in patients with asthma and that is the reason why they are not to be used on their own and they are not to be used on a regular basis uh apart from the short acting beta agonist anticholinergic drugs <clears throat> have also been tried in the treatment of asthma and some people some people believe that oh uh, anticholinergic drugs would not have the same side effects as short acting beta agonist or even perhaps long acting beta agonist <clears throat> and there was a belief among doctors that anticholinergic drugs on their own could be prescribed to asthma patients like ipratropium or tiotropium without giving them any other additional medication and here is a paper that is just published last year that examined the impact of giving only a monotherapy with uh, anticholinergic drugs and they found that clearly if you give them only uh, uh, an anticholinergic drugs it increases asthma exacerbation just like what happens with short acting beta agonists or long acting beta agonists so purely bronchodilators if you give your asthmatic patient only bronchodilator therapy you are going to make the asthma worse you are going to increase bronchial uh, sorry asthma exacerbations by increasing bronchial hyperresponsiveness and you're going to increase asthma mortality and therefore even if you want to use an anticholinergic drug always always combine it with an inhaled corticosteroid It was a message that i just wanted to share with you <clears throat> then in 1990 something spectacular happened in our understanding of asthma uh, this is a one of my colleagues uh, in southampton professor ratko jukanovich uh, he's putting a bronchoscope inside the uh, lung of a mild asthmatic patient trying to take biopsies and a bronco alveolar lavage he has he did that in the late mid and late 1980s collecting bronchial mucosal samples uh, in these patients and then uh, using immunohistochemistry and rt pcr he looked at the molecular changes that occurred in these patients and what they showed in southampton as well as at the imperial college in london was something very interesting that even in mild asthmatic cases or even mild to moderate asthmatic cases the histopathology showed excessive mucus and cellular debris in the lumen presence of epithelial sloughing and intense mucosal inflammation 
recorded uh, in the mid 1980s to 1990s these inflammatory cells were essentially made up of eosinophils so eosinophilic inflammation was present even in patients with mild to moderate disease mast cells were identified and these mast cells were were found to have released the mediators and in collagen deposition at the basement membrane of the epithelial cells altogether this uh, gave us a completely different insight into what happens in asthmatic airways asthma then started becoming recognized as an inflammatory disease of the airways in about 1990 wonderful review article and i was very fortunate uh, to spend about 8 years in the same department where uh, this research took place uh, where asthma uh, was recognized uh, as an inflammatory disorder of the airways uh so i read this 1990 uh, review article in american review of respiratory diseases i was doing my md my post graduation uh, md in respiratory medicine at the bj medical college in pune and i said i am going to do this as my dissertation so 1990 to 1992 uh, the only inhaled corticosteroid that was available at that time was cyplaz biclomethazone inhaler so biclate it was marketed as biclate and salbutamol these were the two inhalers that were available and uh, i was not much aware that you know giving pure acetylene was causing more harm but that was the standard treatment at that point of time so i took about 50 asthma patients and gave them only salbutamol took 50 asthma patients and gave them only uh, a steroid inhaler now at that time there were no spirometers in my department and the only tool that i had was a peak flow meter and a questionnaire so <clears throat> perhaps mine is the first dissertation or first research on <clears throat> on inhaled corticosteroids in the treatment of asthma 1992 and <clears throat> i was able to show that uh, <clears throat> sorry treating asthmatic patients with <clears throat> with uh, inhaled corticosteroids improved symptoms improved quality of life improved peak flow values reduced the exacerbations and also reduced hospitalizations supporting all the you know the patho the pathophysiology that was described uh, by the imperial college team and the southampton team uh, the clinical application of that knowledge was quite obvious that asthma is an inflammatory disease of the airways and therefore inhaled corticosteroids are the main stay of treatment for asthma all patients of asthma must be treated with inhaled corticosteroids a combination of ics plus laba then became the standard norm for the treatment of asthma because they worked in they they had additive uh, effects ics plus laba reduced inflammation caused bronchodilatation and protected the uh, smooth muscles from undergoing spasm so ics plus laba then became the standard treatment for asthma antihistamines that were prescribed for asthma were withdrawn no doctor started doctors were advised not to prescribe antihistamines antileukotrienes were developed but they were found to have a limited role then there was a very very important paper that was published in the new england journal of medicine in the year 2000 it talked about the use of inhaled uh, corticosteroids so the number of canisters of inhaled corticosteroids per year versus asthma deaths and what they found was very interesting if you use your inhaled corticosteroid regularly then you require one canister per month so if you take it regularly for 12 months you would actually need to use 12 canisters and what they found was those who used 12 canisters or regular ics treatment asthma deaths was very small as the use of the canisters reduced asthma deaths increased very very classical if your asthma patient uses only one or two canisters of inhaled corticosteroids per year his risk of dying becomes almost double than those who do not take any of this medication and therefore there's a very nice slope over here that gave a very important message asthmatic patients must use inhaled corticosteroids if they don't they die or they have an increased odds of dying because of their disease so very very important message in 2000 just to take the story a little forward 2019 global burden of disease uh, i was fortunate enough to be the chair for the chronic respiratory disease section for the global burden of disease report that uh, we published in the lancet 
and uh, something very very striking came out from this report uh 42 43.11 percent of all global asthma deaths occurred in india which means that if there are 100 people who are dying due to asthma in the world 43 are from india a very very shameful figure and when you look at uh, you know the prevalence rates the death rates and the disability adjusted life years india ranks number one in the world right on the top we have the most number of asthma cases we have the most number of asthma deaths and we have the most number of asthma suffering that occurs anywhere in the world you can argue that india is a very large country we have a very very large population and therefore obviously the number of cases and deaths will be high not so so here asthma deaths are corrected for the uh, uh, for the total population or you can see ratio between asthma deaths to asthma cases you can see again india is right there on the top for every 1000 asthma cases in india 570 of them die in a year right on the top if you look at what happens in the european countries or the you know, netherlands sweden france canada usa about 8 to 10 people uh, of asthma die out of 1000 asthma deaths 8 to 12 average around the world is around uh, 10 to 20 in india 570 asthmatics die out of 1000 asthmatics which i think uh, tells us a very important and a sad message that we are not doing a good job about asthma management in india and here are the figures <clears throat> that talk about the asthma prevalence cases china was uh, sorry america was the leader of uh, asthma earlier india has just overtaken uh, uh, united states we are around 34.3 million cases of asthma uh, in our country. When it looks, when you look at asthma deaths, no competition for us at all. We are right on the top by a very, very huge margin. Not only that, but this is increasing over the last uh, decade or so. So something that is really worrying for all of us over here. Uh, <clears throat> the global burden of disease uh, that we published gave us some very, very useful information about the asthma burden, asthma deaths, asthma suffering uh, across all the different states in India. So we had information about all the, uh, about all, how much is asthma in every state in India? How many cases are there? How many people die due to asthma uh, in, in every state in India? And then we said, what should be the expected sales of inhaled corticosteroids? So if one asthma patient takes the medication on a regular basis, you will require 12 canisters per year. And we did a very simple mathematical calculation. For the 34.3 million asthmatics in India, when you multiply that by 12, you expect that there should be a sale of around 412 million units of the, the canisters for inhaled corticosteroids. Now, that is the anticipated ideal sale that should happen if all the asthmatics in our country, across all the states, who are taking the inhaled corticosteroids regularly. We then looked at the actual sales of inhaled corticosteroids. And this was from the IQVIA, uh, which is the most, uh, uh, most respected uh, uh, organization that collects the prescription sales of all medications, including inhaled corticosteroids. And then we, we through the IQVIA, we asked them, what is the sale of inhaled corticosteroids in India? And what we found was a stunning huge gap over here. So the actual sales of ICS in India is 39.6 million units. The ideal sales should be 412 million units. And look at the discrepancy between that. Huge discrepancy. So only about 6 to 8% of the asthmatics in India actually probably use adequate doses of inhaled corticosteroids. And maybe this is the reason why we have such large asthma deaths uh, across the world. Here is a, a, a wonderful map of... Uh, you know, this is the expected sales of inhaled corticosteroids for every state in India in grey. And what is the actual sales of inhaled corticosteroids? It gives you some very useful information as well. Uh, asthma burden is highest in Uttar Pradesh, as you can see here. Then Bihar, Orissa, Rajasthan, West Bengal, Kerala, Karnataka, Maharashtra and so on. Now, based on the numbers of asthmatics, we said, okay, the sale of inhaled corticosteroids in Uttar Pradesh should be 49 million canisters. But the actual sales is only 4 million canisters. And you can see the same thing for all the states across India and 
it's a very pathetic uh, state where we know that there is a lot of underuse of inhaled corticosteroids. This has just been published in Lung India online version. So you can go to the website and you can see this paper. We also then correlated the use of inhaled corticosteroids versus asthma deaths. Every dot over here is a, is a state in India. So this is a state that uses, uh, uh, you know, less than 10 canisters uh, per, per, per year. And this is a state that uses, you know, uh, more number of canisters. So there's a very nice correlation that we found that as the sales of inhaled corticosteroids increases, the asthma deaths decreases or the, or the other way around. When the sales of inhaled corticosteroid reduces, asthma deaths in the states increase. Now, this is for deaths and this is for uh, disability adjusted life years, suffering. Very, very clear message that there is an underuse of inhaled corticosteroids in India. Less than 10% of the asthmatics actually get the right medication, uh, which is inhaled corticosteroids. Very, very important message. We all know that asthma is a very strong genetic disease, and that is the reason why we keep on probing about is there anybody in the family who suffers from asthma? Is there anybody in the family who suffers with allergic rhinitis and eczema and allergic rhinoconjunctivitis and migraine and so on? Because they all fall under the category of atopy. And asthma is a component of atopy, and atopy is the one that is genetically transmitted. So it's a very, very strong gene. If the gene is there, it's likely to be uh, showcased. So here is a people tree. There's no soil, there's no water. But just because it got deposited over here, just because of its genetic power, you can see that it can even grow on walls over here. Uh, the environment is also equally important uh, for asthma. So, if, so if, the, if the soil is nice, there's plenty of water, minerals, plenty of sunshine, uh, you know, then, then, then the flowers come in. And these are allergens, air pollutants, microbial infections, weather changes. Emotional factors were all what I call as environmental factors that are associated with asthma. So asthma is a gene environmental interaction. Both the gene is important and the environment are equally important. And something important over here is emotional factors, especially as India becomes a richer and richer country, stress levels increase, and this then becomes an important triggering and a risk factor for asthma. Obesity is a very, very important risk factor for asthma which I will cover in a subsequent slide. There are a lot of myths and stigmas and misbeliefs that are associated with asthma. You know, you do a simple survey out into the community, you will find all these amazing myths that people have. Asthma is a contagious, communicable and deadly disease resulting in lifelong suffering and early death is what people believe. Uh, asthma can affect a person's academic, sports, cultural and social performance. And in other words, asthmatics cannot lead a normal life, is what people in the community believe. Uh, inhalers contain very powerful drugs, should be used only when sparing, only sparingly and only in the last terminal stages of the disease. Otherwise, you should not use inhalation therapy or inhalers uh, for the treatment of asthma because they're addictive, they're harmful, a lot of side effects. And then inhaled corticosteroids, which is a cornerstone of asthma treatment, it saves lives. People say corticosteroids cause a lot of side effects. My relatives, my friends, my doctors themselves say you don't take steroids for the treatment of your asthma. So these are all the myths, the stigmas and the misbeliefs that are associated with asthma. The reality is quite different. Here are, here are some images of all the famous asthmatics. And they just tell you a very important message that just because they have asthma doesn't stop them from becoming famous in the world. Whether you are a sportsman, whether you are a whether you are an actor, uh, whether you are a politician, whatever you are, nothing can stop an asthmatic from uh, becoming the best in the world. Even Olympic Games, you can win gold medals, even if you're an asthmatic. Uh, the two photographs over here, which I would specifically like to mention is Professor Peter Barnes from Imperial College and Professor Stephen Holgate, my mentor from Southampton in the UK. These are the two great asthma researchers who pioneered uh, the science behind the inflammatory mechanisms of asthma and why inhaled corticosteroids is the most important treatment. So these are the two pioneers and they themselves uh, suffer with asthma. I uh, just wanted to show you the precedents. 70% uh, of the presidents of the United States have had asthma. And jokingly, some people say that, oh, you want to become the next president of the United States? Do you have asthma? 
no, then you're unlikely to become the next president. So that's how that's how important uh, this message is. Uh, fast food is one of the important risk factors for asthma. We talk about allergies to cats and dogs and flowers, and I think they're more important in the Western world. In our part of the world, there are other risk factors. Air pollution is an important risk factor. Uh, you know, fast foods, consumption of fast foods has been shown to be a very important risk factor for asthma as well as a triggering factor for asthma. And in fact, the, there's so much of growing evidence to suggest that even obesity is an important risk factor for asthma. Uh, very, very important. So these are risk factors that we should be aware about uh, that are more applicable in the year 2020 than in the 1980s. Management of mild asthma. Uh, so if you had uh, symptoms less than two times per week, then the recommendation was use salbutamol SOS. If your symptoms were more than two times per week, then you start regular inhaled corticosteroids. This started in the 1980s, went on to the 1990s, up to 2018. How many of you all still practice this? If you see an asthma patient who says, Doctor, only once in a week I get these symptoms, and maybe once in two weeks or once in 10 days. Uh, what, uh, what treatment should I take? And maybe you are, request, you are suggesting them to use an inhaled salbutamol as and when required. Uh, this is the wrong thing to do. 2022, this is, this is not the right treatment. And I'll tell you why. 2018, there's a very big study called as a, the Sigma-1 study where they took mild asthmatics, mild asthmatics, and they uh, randomized them into three treatment arms, short-acting beta agonists only, as and when required, like this one over here, or ICS plus LABA, as and when required, only when required, or <clears throat> the third arm giving uh, inhaled corticosteroids regularly, twice a day, and the short-acting beta agonists like salbutamol or formotrol, uh, only as and when required. So the three treatment arms, they were followed over a period of time. And what they showed was something very, very important. The blue line over here represents those patients who received only short-acting beta agonists as and when required. And the two lines over here are the ones who got the inhaled corticosteroid, either as and when required or on a regular basis. And this is the number of exacerbations. So clearly, clearly, there's a very, very important message that if you start your patient who has mild asthma only on as and when required salbutamol for that matter, this person is going to end up having a significantly increased number of exacerbations over the next one year. Significant increase in the number of asthma, asthma exacerbations. And in the number of severe exacerbations also, there's a big difference between the two. So the Sigma-1 study actually challenged the belief that this is the correct treatment for a asthmatic. And so in fact, they said either give ICS plus LABA as required or you give ICS on a regular basis and give SABA as and when required. There's another study called Sigma-2 again in 2018. Compared ICS LABA as and when required versus ICS BD plus SABA SOS. And uh, what they were able to show was Wherever there is an ICS, whether you use it as and when required or whether you use it uh, on a regular basis, the asthma exacerbations remain the same between the two groups. There's not, not much difference. But the patients who received ICS plus LABA as and when required, not on a regular basis, they had more asthma symptoms than, who, than those who received ICS on a regular basis. Now, these two studies have changed the way we treat our mild, uh, so-called mild to moderate asthma cases. None of them should now be treated with only short acting or only bronchodilators like salbutamol. Very, uh, very, very important uh, novel start study published in 2019. So 2018, the next year, again, salbutamol as required, budesonide twice a day, salbutamol, budesonide and this and formotron as and when required. Another big study, 52 weeks. And the, to cut the long story short, the same message. If you give your patient only salbutamol, you're causing more harm to this patient, more exacerbations and more risk, more risk of dying. And therefore, the GINA guidelines in 2020, soon after that, in step one, they have omitted that. Salbutamol SOS has been omitted. 
what it means is even if your asthma patient has mild intermittent disease intermittent even in those patients you have to give them inhaled corticosteroids now whether you give them inhaled corticosteroids plus a uh, short acting beta agonist or a long acting beta agonist as and when required or whether you give the inhaled corticosteroid on a regular basis and the bronchodilator uh, on a as and when basis both of them as of now are currently recommended as the treatment for mild to moderate cases of asthma so it's a big change that has happened in asthma management in the last couple of years uh here is another study uh, just recently published a few weeks ago in the new england journal of medicine african blacks and the latin uh, uh, american asthmatics now this is the uh, group of as group of people living there ethnic group who have a uh, higher prevalence of asthma and poor asthma control moderate to severe asthma 72% had at least one exacerbation that led to the use of an oral corticosteroid now these patients were uh, randomized into two groups usual care ics ics lava whatever they were taking and the second group was usual ca care plus the reliever triggered beclomethazone 80 micrograms do you need a reliever okay take the reliever but every time you've got take a reliever every time you take the beclomethazone 80 micrograms only beclomethazone you continue with your regular treatment with maybe uh, uh, budesonide or fluticasone along with the long acting beta agonist but whenever you use a reliever medication like salbutamol or levosalbutamol you have to take this additional puff of beclomethazone when followed over a period of 15 months we can see that usual care versus the intervention care in red and this is the exacerbation frequency you can see there is a significant reduction in the severe asthma exacerbations the asthma control test also got better among those patients who were taking the beclomethazone whenever the short acting beta agonist was taken and so was the asthma symptom scores very important message very very important message that uh, you know if a if a patient has got moderate to severe asthma you take the regular treatment whenever you using a bronchodilator beclomethazone add beclomethazone to that uh although inhalation therapy is the cornerstone of asthma management safest fastest most effective way of delivering drugs do doctors know how to use inhalers correctly this was a study that we did when i was at chest research foundation in 2006 so we took a group of uh, doctors nurses physiotherapists about 400 of them showed them a pressurized meter dose inhaler and said have you seen this device 99% said yes you know what it is used for 99% said yes it is used for asthma and cp do you know how to use it 95% said yes i know how to use it Could you please demonstrate, and then we gave them the placebo, and we said, "Please show us how to use this inhaler." You know how many of them got it correct? All the steps correct? Very, very sad. Less than one percent over here of the doctors knew how to use the inhaler correctly. You know who are the best? Most graduate students of respiratory medicine. Nine percent knew how to use the inhaler device correctly. Ninety-one percent did not know. how to use the inhaler device correctly despite the fact that 95% said yes i know how to use it they believe they know how to use it but actually only less than 1% know how to use the inhaler device correctly what is even more shocking is this fact 50% of the doctors believe themselves believe that inhalers were adequate so if this is what is happening with the medical community with the doctors we can only imagine what is getting uh, translated into real life clinical practice uh dr uh, parthasarthi bhattacharya from kolkata did a very very interesting study so he's a he he is a consultant he sees a lot of patients and uh, he was getting a lot of these asthmatic patients from uh, from other doctors you know, these patients were not satisfied and therefore they came to him and he said can you show me a prescription of what your, what treatment you are receiving so he took the took 100 prescriptions uh, of asthmatics from kolkata city those who were uh, who were you know who did not were not happy with the treatment that they were receiving uh, so the, the prescriptions were from mbbs doctors md medicine doctors uh, dm and respiratory medicine doctors and so on and then he kept a very simple clinical record investigations performed prescriptions written by these doctors for the asthma patients and you know what he found this is what he found investigations ordered look at spirometry only 10% have 
of them had actually had a spirometry test. The diagnosis of asthma was written only on 30% of the cases. 70% the doctor didn't even write the diagnosis, did not even inform the patient that you have asthma. And then look at this, no asthma medication, only oral medicines and ICS plus lava, which is the correct treatment. And this is the proportion of the doctors. So 10% of the MBBS doctors gave the right treatment, 90% did not. MD medicine was said 26%, 75% did not give ICS lava. And look at this, even DM students, only 7% gave the correct treatment. Now, that is very, very unfortunate. So this is the real life that is happening about asthma management. And this is something that we need to worry about. I was the national leader for a very big study called as the Asia Pacific Asthma Insights and Management uh, Survey. A survey that was carried out in nine Asia Pacific countries. You can see India was one of them. And this is a study that looked at all aspects of asthma uh, among randomly selected asthmatics from across the country. And to cut the long story short, these were the results. So when we looked at patients reporting daytime symptoms, you can see there are four columns over here, United States, Europe and Canada, Latin America, and this is the Asia Pacific, nine countries that took part. We compared with what is happening in the other parts of the world, United States, Europe and Canada, and Latin America. Patients reporting daytime symptoms. India is one of the countries that is right on the top, daytime symptoms. Nighttime symptoms, India is right on the top, no competition for it. Look at the other, the other parts of the world. And when it comes to asthma control, based on a proper asthma control test, wow, we are right at the bottom over here, compared to what other countries are. Not that the other countries are doing well, even they are also doing bad. Huge number of them do not have their asthma well under control. But India in particular is right, right, right at the bottom. And I think uh, when we published this, uh, you know, the investigators from other countries were asking me, Dr. Salvi, what is so special in India that your asthma control seems to be so bad? And then I had to explain to them. We also asked in the study, uh, uh, you know, the impact of asthma on their life. My asthma makes me feel like I don't have control of my life. This green colored over here in the middle is India. 80% of the asthmatic said yes to that. I feel inadequate in relation to my peers due to my asthma. 64% of patients in India said yes. And how my asthma affects how I feel about myself. More than 70% said yes. So you can see that asthma in India is very, very poorly managed as compared to the rest of the world. Uh, so just to come to the end of this presentation, this I'm mean, just to show you the controversies and how uh, the knowledge with these controversies have actually changed the practice. Uh, something to do with COVID. Are people with uh, asthma at an increased risk of COVID-19 or severe COVID-19? And the answer is no. Unless the patients have received oral corticosteroids in the last couple of weeks, uh, they do not have an increased risk of catching the COVID-19 infection or even developing the severe uh, form of COVID-19. Are people with asthma at an increased risk of COVID-19 related death? Answer is still no. If you're an asthmatic, doesn't mean that you're going to die uh, more than what other people do, unless uh, you have received oral corticosteroids uh, for an asthma exacerbation. So that clearly has been associated uh, with increased COVID uh, deaths and COVID severity. Uh, what are the implications for asthma management during the COVID times? Well, you continue with your regular inhaled medication, whether it is inhaled corticosteroid or whether it is an inhaled corticosteroid with a long acting beta agonist. Uh, do not change anything. Continue with the same, absolutely the same treatment that you are receiving. You know, interestingly, there are some asthma medications that have been found to be effective, so called effective in the treatment of COVID 19. Cyclosonide was one of them, Budesonide was the other drug. And third, more recently, is uh, Montelukast. Three asthma medications that have good anti-COVID effects. And uh, so perhaps, you know, asthmatics receiving these medications uh, may be, uh, in fact, protected from catching the severe form of the COVID-19 infection. Uh, have there been more asthma exacerbations during the pandemic? And the answer is no. Uh, certainly not in the first and the second phase. I have a little doubt about the, uh, uh, the Omicron wave that we had recently, I did see of quite a few asthma patients having an exacerbation 
during this uh, the the omicron wave and i'm not sure whether that is uh, the reason uh, for why more asthmatics were seen because of covid and maybe this is a point that we will cover during the panel discussion and the last uh, slide that i wanted to share with you is about uh, vaccination in patients with covid-19 uh should asthma patients receive the covid-19 vaccine the answer is yes they should uh but uh, in, but but asthmatics may have allergies to something so in general the allergic reactions uh, to the vaccines are very rare if there is a known allergy uh, patient has got a history of severe allergic reaction to covid-19 vaccine ingredient like polyethylene glycol for example uh, which is present in the pfizer vaccine or the astrazeneca vaccine then they should um, they should not use this but by and large i think in india i am not aware of any single report having been any single case have been reported that after an asthma vaccination uh, asthma got worse so this is not there uh, people with allergies to food insect venom or other medications can safely receive a covid-19 vaccine so i think uh, with this i'm going to stop over here <coughs> and uh, we will go on to the panel discussion where i have a fantastic team of uh, panelists who will uh, who will address some very important questions that each one of us would like to have an answer and i look forward to that panel discussion thank you very much thank you very much thank you so uh, dr vijay kumar you want to say something before we initiate the panel discussion no sir my um, uh, i thoroughly enjoyed uh, your talk sir it was uh, so uh, well uh, articulated it was really super honest appreciations from bottom of my heart thank you sir thank you thank you very much uh, dr vijay kumar Uh, so with this we will start with the panel discussion and as i said we are very very fortunate to have some eminent and uh, excellent uh, pulmonologists from across the country uh, dr jay raman from chennai dr pramod uh, jhavar from indore dr ajay langevar from nagpur and dr vijay kumar from uh, hyderabad so thank you very much for joining this uh, panel discussion and maybe maybe the first question that i would like to ask everybody i mean what are the key messages that you took from this presentation something that really hit you hard and you believe that that is something that you would like to change in our country so uh, dr vijay kumar maybe can we start with you yes sir so the impact of asthma is uh, um, hardly uh, whatever we are doing we are celebrating this world asthma day and then to increase the awareness lot of things um from our side from uh, as a pulmonologists and physicians as well okay they are all we are all doing good job but what we are thinking is we are doing a good job but that is not actually practically translating in one of the nejm study when uh, it says that whenever a poor principal uh, got discovered um, in uh, west if it has to reach to the village remote village in a developing country something like africa or india something like that so it needs at least two decades but it's been the inhalers as a um, as a uh, play a vital role of uh, in management of asthma particularly ics and ics plus laba combination smart therapy so on and so forth so uh, we know since more than two decades but what is is it is not translating into practice we have to really pull our socks and then increase the awareness much more that's what i learned sir okay thank you thank you, thank you dr vijay kumar dr dr pramod jhavar what is your take on the presentation that i made anything that struck you hard that the use of inhaled corticosteroid is, is very less because there are so many taboos in the society to it are uh, the habitual farming and they are going to cause a lot many of the side effects and uh, many of the even educated people does not want uh, steroid is a word which uh, is going to 
get a very hard impact on the brain and uh, the patient denied on the this ethical medical treatment and going on the other another like homeopathy fish therapy some acupuncture and all that so as the myths about the inner cortical stress is still very high and uh, it has to be uh, addressed very properly it is not a, it is inhalation it's going to be a microgram dosage is actually acting at the site of the bronchial tubes and where it is the rate and even just a single inhaler uh the the doses like can be even this drug like sarcosinite is only getting uh, uh acting only in the this bronchial secretion where where this, where this ester enzyme is are there so no any local side effects also so i think uh, uh inhaled corticosteroids being the main part in the treatment of inflammatory chronic asthmatic patient with the inflammation it is to be addressed very properly with the sound noise by the all the chest patient okay, this is the main treatment Dr. Lanjewar? <clears throat> yes, uh, before answering to your question, uh, in fact, uh, I just saw a question which has popped in. Will, can I answer the question? Please. There is a, there is a Madam Aarti Shahade from Maharashtra, Pune. She has asked a question, how to use inhaler correctly? Is there a video for the patients? <laughs> so let me tell her that there are so many videos are available in from the company, from the people, in local languages everywhere. But the best thing is, whoever is your treating doctor if he can show you in front of in front of him if he can demonstrate all the steps that is the best way to learn and to get educated and coming to the point i think uh, the we we i think we missed on one important thing that the as dr pramod jawar was saying that there is a kind of steroid phobia so steroid phobia is not only in the mind of common people but even in the mind of highly educated people hello yeah yeah we can, can hear you can please you, please yeah. go ahead yes so so not only in the mind of the common people but as well as in the mind of the educated people particularly professional so what i feel what has most important thing which has got stuck up dr sandeep is that there is no transition because we have not reached to a level where professionals are convinced that the inhaled corticosteroid is going to be their main treatment very, once very we important. do that adequately the once that person is convinced then the transmitting to the general population whether it is urban whether it is rural it will be a easy task it will be doable thing excellent point you. excellent point uh, <laughs> as always ajay uh, dr jayaraman i'm sorry good to cut you last but you're the most important person <laughs> good evening thank you very much i enjoyed your presentation very beautiful sir from the historical perspective to the latest controversies about the various studies and all so thank you sincere for this wonderful you uh, know um uh, sandeep sir sir and vijay ajay and pramod thank you very much so from your presentation i understand that a lot of asthma deaths because of the mono prescription of the only a solvent my inhaler this is very very hazardous we prescribe more and more we are seeing lot of prescriptions from the gp side and general medicine side we are seeing only the uh, inhaler only some of them are delivery inhaler they are using doctor this inhaler is very helpful doctor is a symptom i am living this is i am using the clearly doctor so patient is using very wrong medication that's why the asthma death are not very high so in india education is very very important asthma education because asthma is a chronic disease majority they said uh, majority they think in, in terms of uh, my asthma is acute disease that the one month two months uh, i am using after that i am fine doctor again now two two years after that i feel lot of breathing is used wheezing cough and all so these kind of things all because of the mono prescription of the salutamol inhaler under utilization of the inhaled corticosteroids you all know inhaled corticosteroids is the backbone for asthma management so so we have to educate a lot of patients in the metro cities we are all some awareness but go to the urban area rural areas there is no awareness about the uh, the inhaler medication at all so as the asthma society we have to educate the patient single use there is a mono prescription of aspirin that is that is a, sorry this is a salvitamol is one of the worst thing it leads lot of asthma exacerbation attack and the uh, asthma attempt yes sir. this is my uh, take <laughs> can i make a can i make a suggestion please, please. you know all the doctors who are listening to this must make a pledge that from tomorrow onwards i am going to prescribe i am going to use inhaled corticosteroids in all my patients of asthma i am going to underuse the role of uh, short acting beta agonists like salbutamol in the treatment of my asthma patient i think everybody should take a pledge yes. if there are 
uh, doctors from medical colleges who are listening to this if there are senior consultants and others who are listening to this they must take a they must make a promise that i will educate 10 other doctors about the importance of not only inhalation therapy but about the importance of inhaled corticosteroids in asthma management i think that should be uh, because then only you know we will expand uh, the the knowledge base that we have learned from today so I'm dr dr jayaram coming back to you again uh you know many doctors many doctors find it very difficult to communicate with the patient about the importance and the use of inhaled corticosteroids and in particular obviously inhaled corticosteroids how do you speak to them how do you convince them how do you, how do you allay the fears and anxiety about inhalation therapy what are your secrets that you know that help uh, you know through your experience of so many years uh, other doctors could also benefit yeah see asthma management asthma is a chronic disease inflammatory disease so reversible obstructive airway disease which needs the long term treatment like long treatment with the inhaled corticosteroids lot of uh, myths about the inhaled corticosteroids steroids you know no no even my own uh, gynecologist they don't don't give any inhaled steroid you give only sorbitamol that is that, that is fine for pregnancy asthma no ma'am this is a very important steroid backbone treatment is the uh, this asthma treatment Backbone is the only steroid only. That to inhale corticosteroids, it acts only in the local respiratory system. It won't absorb in the blood circulation. It won't cause any major side effect. This is one of the control. Controlling the inflammation is a very important thing. Not relieving symptom alone. So take the example: if you have a headache due to brain tumor or TB inside, so if you give a simple painkillers, it will it won't cure. So you have to give the proper TB medicines or tumor medicine. Then only the headache will subside. Likewise, in asthma, it's a inflammatory, controllable, controllable disease. You have to give a controlled medications regular basis. Then only you can control the disease. If you take the regular medications, you won't develop any symptom at all. If you have a symptom, you use only sulfatamol inhaler. When you have symptom long term, like long, it will worsen the life. More and more exacerbation, more and more asthma attack, more and more asthma deaths. So, my doctors, please understand. This is the very important. The backbone of asthma treatment is the inhaled corticosteroids, regular use, which will control. You can enjoy all the life. You can play well. A lot of celebrities having several issues of asthma. They are doing wonderful achievement. So, the inhaled corticosteroids is very important. Technique is very very important. So, this way we tell. We, I am the IMA academic chair. We go for every meeting for general practitioners, IMA doctors. So we we teach them thoroughly with the asthma CME and asthma workshop devices, pyrometry, everything. So this way we can update our so relation with the doctor. So so Ajay, I I want I want really how do you communicate with the patient? What language do you use? Can I can I pitch in? Yes yes please Ajay. What I generally do, I mean, I just give a one minute story that one year back one of my batchmate uh, uh, gynecologist she came with her daughter who is to be gynecologist. and when i said that this is very symptomatic and i started giving medrol solimedrol tablet when i just said that she needs 7 to 2 days to 14 days of steroid can you imagine what was the reaction of the to be doctor gynecologist and the mother gynecologist steroid no is it really important so just to add like what i do generally to tell you about steroid is i tell them in a very simple language sometimes in a very local hindi or marathi language कि जैसे अगर किसी को टाइफाइड हुआ है या किसी को निमोनिया हुआ है उसमें सिम्टम तो फीवर का रहेगा और भी सिम्टम रहेंगे अगर हम उसको क्रोसिन से ठीक करेंगे तो बुखार चले जाएगा लेकिन टाइफाइड का जो है इटियोलॉजी पैथोजेनेसिस वो खत्म नहीं होगा या निमोनिया का जो है अगर विदाउट एंटीबायोटिक हम ठीक नहीं कर सकते दैट इज हाउ आई टेल दैट इफ यू गिव यू मेडिकेशन either in the form of ओरल सेल्बोटामोल टैबलेट और इनेलर इट विल ऑनली टेक केयर ऑफ सिम्टोमेटिक रिलीफ system will be relieved but it will not take care of the main mechanism which is giving rise to that is how i try to communicate dr vijay kumar how do you communicate what do you speak what language first and how all, do you uh, uh, first of all the, uh, i believe in that concept of extra 2 minutes so after regular consultation and all those things i give that extra 2 minutes of i train them inhaler personally that is the first important which i have nurtured uh, by looking at seniors like you so i practice that that itself is convincing them point number 1 point number 2 is uh, majority of the uh, time i i notice ignorance is a bliss so when people the, there will be certain at least 50% of people 
they come they you know whatever you say they they assume that you are god and then they will uh, take whatever prescription you they don't comment the problem comes with the rest of the 50% of patients where i tell them this extra one minute uh, i i spend and tell them so if you have diabetes if you have hypertension so do you check your sugar levels and then take a regular medication or do you measure your blood pressure and then take medication or you when it is everything is controlled you continue to use medication or stop in a, inadvertently so they themselves comes and then agrees yes sir when it is blood pressure or diabetes like chronic problems we stick on to medications because we have fear that if bp is not controlled our heart stops or we may get heart attack stroke kind of thing so then similarly i apply when you don't manage your asthma with chronic medication regular maintenance therapy you will land in trouble that's what i do sir very very important so some of the other examples that i give is many patients will say doctor do i need to take this treatment for a long period of time uh, doctor i feel perfectly well you know i have been taking these inhalers for the last 15 days or 3 weeks can i stop them very very common questions but doctor do i really need to take it for a lifetime or for a long period of time the answer that i give is uh, you know if you have glasses because you got a number uh, well so do you complain that uh, you you you're wearing glasses and do you ever come and tell the ophthalmologist ki oh i have used it for 7 days 10 days 2 weeks 1 month uh, i am feeling much better with that should i stop using the glasses and i think that's a very important uh, message that goes to them similarly as you said dr vijay kumar do diabetics stop their medication when the blood sugars come back to normal they don't because they have the fear that if the blood sugar levels increase i am going to have all the complications of diabetes i think the lung is also a very badly neglected organ if yeah, people take the lung for granted so what if i get an exacerbation but people don't realize that it exa- that exacerbation can kill and therefore when you have a chronic disease like asthma you need to take medications on a long term basis now this is the fundamental things that we described that we discussed now may i go to uh, uh, dr uh, jairaman again pramod wants to add uh, pramod wants to add something please sir whenever patient comes to the clinic in the asthmatic room na i just say them this is the breathing tube you say here how breathing tubes are normal but you are having the problem you are taking the medication off and on become okay and after change of either sometimes some triggers then again you are coming with the same symptoms so your main problem is inflammation here it is just inflammation which we have to cover and they were on you are having the only symptomatic treatment whatever taking the treatment is only for the spasmodic airway not for the root cause that is inflammation one thing is very clear patient is having in their mind for the chronic therapies breathometer is a one of the right tool to place to every patient of bronchial asthma when they see the lung number they are so confident about the therapy after a week time when they come to doctor they have acute exacerbation their pp floods are very low very symptomatic and as soon as you just provide them the breathometer and explain these models to the patients they are happily going to take the medication rightly in when the patient is in the remission phase when his peak flow metras are in the normal range in the remission then surely i think the it is right time to get the reduces the doses also because the patients are uh, always worrying about sabhi the subah sham dawai leni matlab it is to it long life long so we have to say them some some day or time the your asthma go into remission and that you can clinically judge by your symptoms and breathe matter so i think this is very important uh, uh, two two very important points you mentioned about the use of a breathe matter tube to explain to the patient very very important those doctors who do not have those breathe matter tubes with them please speak to your supplier representative and ask them to give you the breathing tubes which we can use in a clinic to explain to the patient very very important another very important you think uh, important point you raised was use of a peak flow meter i genuinely believe that all asthmatic patients must be given a peak flow meter at home they should be prescribed a peak flow meter you know it is such a useful device to see how their level of asthma control is look at the diurnal variability look at how the lung the spirometric values improve after they started on the right medication and then they maintain that level uh, for a long time so use of a peak flow meter is very very important 
doctors can use a peak flow meter in their clinic to diagnose asthma if they don't have a spirometer. Do a baseline peak flow meter, give them two puffs of uh, salbutamol or liver salbutamol, wait for 20 minutes, repeat the peak flow metry test again, and if the value increases by around 15 to 20 percent, you will know that there is good bronchodilator reversibility. There was spasm which relieved significantly with this, likely to be asthma. So you can you can use this as a screening tool in your patients. Now, very I want very short answers because we have only about 15 minutes. And there are very, very important questions that I want to address. So one question to every uh, panelist, and maybe you can take the shortest amount of time to explain that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Raman, uh, ICS, ICS plus LABA is a standard treatment, but many patients do not uh, respond to this. And we then need to think about biologics. So who are the asthmatic patients in which you consider the use of biologics? And what biologics do you use? And what is your personal opinion about the use of biologics in the treatment of asthma? Yes, sir. thank you, sir. So, role of biologicals in asthma. It comes in a severe asthma, step five. Step five, you all know well about that severe asthma. Asthma, despite the maximum optimized treatment with the high dose of uh, ICS LABA and LAMA, triple threat therapy, so based on the persistent symptoms, and we are checking the adequacy of the technique of inhalation and the comorbid conditions we are treating, and the adherence is very fine. So despite that, patient is having uh, you no know, symptoms, nocturnal symptoms and day symptoms, not able to control. These kind of patients comes into the category of the um, uh, severe asthma. In the severe asthma, we have a targeted therapy that is uh, mainly to find out uh, the uh, that is uh, immunoglobulin E level. We have to find out. That is uh, interleukin-5, interleukin-4, and uh, TSLP. So we have to find out the interleukins. Because interleukins are the inflammatory markers, one of the important markers for asthma. In step five, we have to assess the phenotypic markers, assess the phenotype, and which uh, marker, which phenotype is uh, highly elevated. Predominantly, we come across allergic asthma. There is a type two inflammatory asthma. This is the commonest uh, asthma phenotype. Eosinophil level will be very high. And in that case, we used to prescribe more than 10, 15 years, we are prescribing the anti-IgE omalizumab. So omalizumab is that after six years, persistent severe asthma, we do the omalizumab prescription. The dosage of 75 to uh, 350 uh, no, milligram, two to four weeks gap, we have to monitor. So before that, we have to check the every parameters, Ig level and all. So alternatively, recently, so we have addition in India, there is other uh, uh, biological availables are the, the uh, anti-IL-5, mainly the Vepertisumab, Resilisumab, and the uh, Bentalisumab are available here. So Omalisumab is one of the important uh, you know, biologicals we use to write for the patients uh, of severe asthma, category, severe asthma. So despite maximum medications, despite the uh, you know, checking all the inhalation technique, device technique, adherence, Comorbid conditions like uh, obesity, uh, rhinosinusitis, GRD, everything is, we are uh, you know, taking into consideration, addressing, despite their patient having symptoms. Then the role of biologicals, amalizumab, benralizumab, propolizumab, all the uh, monoclonal antibodies plays a major role to target the therapy to control the inflammation in a better way. Yes. What profession of asthmatic patients do you need to prescribe biologics and what is your personal opinion, your impression yes. about the efficacy yes. of these? Less than 5%, less than 5% of uh, severe asthma category. So we require this kind of the uh, immunotherapy using the uh, monoclonal antibodies, mainly the Omali and the Polisman. So less than 5% in my practice. Yes. Dr. Vijay uh, Kumar, uh, yes, sir. brittle asthma, difficult to treat asthma. How do you, how do you manage them? Sir, uh, first, uh, most important thing in the, uh, as you mentioned, we have to give a very quick answer. So most important thing, what whether the adherence to the given treatment is there or not. First of all, that is the most key step. Make sure you your patient de demonstrate the inhaler therapy properly. We have seen wide variety of, you know, um, uh, abnormal usage of inhalers. That means um, um, taking a pill of uh, the rotacaps, respi caps as a pills. So it doesn't work. And then similarly, improper usage of uh, inhalers like uh, puffing into the air 
and then you know breathing that air so these kind of thing there are 100 other abnormalities first first important is check the pulmonary function test confirm the diagnosis and once diagnosis confirmed and whether the patient is uh, strict religiously using the inhaler or not and the type of inhaler that you have prescribed and whether adherence and uh, method with which he is uh, taking inhaler these are the very very key steps before labeling them as a difficult to treat asthma or brittle asthma both these excellent sir. excellent ajay uh, cough variant asthma a lot of patients have only symptoms of cough spirometry normal how do you what do you do with these patients yeah particularly this category we generally see in female patients they are generally from second decade to fourth decade onward and uh, we generally observe that these are the patient who are having variability but the symptom of wheezing and shortness of breath are missing so they predominantly present with cough mainly it is after exposure to cold or some irritant and these are the people who are very difficult to convince that they have asthma the main sim- reason behind is because we had for asthma we have a symptom complex symptom complex of cough shortness of breath wheezing and chest tightness the, the name Here, itself the name also it's name itself is cough variant asthma so yeah. these are patient who are generally falls into category where they do response to inhaled corticosteroid but they have predominant symptom because of cough and the majority of them are having symptoms starting from allergic rhinitis so they have either sinusitis to top up or a post nasal drip and which is yet to go into the lower respiratory tract and give rise to severe spasmodic airways so these are the particular patient where we had to be very clear about that we will be treating them by giving them a written action plan to make them aware about what are the exacerbating and precipitating causes and to take care of inhaled corticosteroid as well as in and particularly the use of ipratropium bromide very good very good thank you thank you ajay the word asthma in various languages is translated as dama or shortness of breath and these patients will say doctor how can you say i have asthma i don't have shortness of breath i am coming to you only with a cough and this cough is terrible it keeps me awake at night i get up in the middle of the night and i have to keep on coughing uh it cannot be asthma because uh, there is no breathlessness i think it's a very common condition very easily treated with inhaled corticosteroids and i think a therapeutic trial with inhaled corticosteroids actually makes the correct diagnosis doctor and to add that? and to add to them that certain uh, laboratory tests which we have particularly pfr yeah. monitoring and as well as pft with a good bronchodilation can be a good guide to convince them very good very good dr pramod jawar uh, comorbidities associated with asthma what are the most common comorbid conditions associated and how do you treat them so asthma is usually the allergic rhinitis usually because of the allergy start from the nose and then it goes to trickle down to the uh, airways and uh, many of the patients are having sleep apnea obesity hypertension syndrome third the patient may be with the grd gastrointestinal reflux disorder patient may be on a, a multiple drug, drugs like ac inhibitors beta blockers patient may with the joint pains may be on the uh, nsids on long term so uh, environmental condition but these are the uh, major criteria which we must look out uh, to each and every patient to exclude the because no one is going to examine the nose always we examine the throat the uh, chest only so in a airway disease nose is very important to uh, get examined uh, properly and let away and no one is going to open the mouth how the tongues are there how the crowded jaws are there, how big the this tonsil glands are there so there are so many lady uh, friend reflux gerd and so many things are there excellent excellent so please look for presence of comorbid conditions in your asthma patients if they are present treat them aggressively because if you don't treat the comorbids asthma will not get better mm-hmm. i think that's the message dr vijay kumar role of vaccination in in asthma should we should we vaccinate all our asthmatic patients with influenza with uh, pneumococcal vaccine with other vaccines what is your what is your take on that sir uh, before just uh, uh, getting into that question i would love to uh, announce um, a technical team has forwarded that it is 952 pan india logins okay for this uh, uh, that, that's a brilliant achievement from cca and the technical team thank you and uh, 
coming to one more important thing sir dr yes, shushmita uh, our good friend from kolkata has uh, uh, enquired about how to manage mild asthma in children and uh, what laba doses do you prefer in children over to you sir <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, this is not an easy answer the the traditional uh, guidelines uh, uh, they are they are very silent on this uh there is a need to do uh, some clinical trials to understand what is the right medication the right dose uh, in pediatric asthma patients by and large i think my take on that is all pediatric asthma patients must be given an inhaled corticosteroid because that's the only treatment that works it reduces the inflammation and prevents these young boys girls from developing a chronic uh, airway ailment in the future so i would give them most certainly i would give them an inhaled corticosteroid the long acting beta agonist that i would prefer and suggest is formotrol to be given in the same dose as we give for adults because the dosage does not change between children and adults and that's what i would do in these patients uh if anybody has any other uh, thank you sir let me answer uh, the, this yeah, question yeah. Know, which you have posed me so vaccination it is mandatory because it's the commonest uh, one of the commonest you uh, know cause of uh, um, exacerbation severe exacerbation is probably there may be associated pneumonia may very likely viral pneumonia kind of things or upper respiratory tract infections so these are the two common things which we can prevent up front is uh, one is uh, influenza virus and second is pneumococcal disease so please make sure that all of your uh, asthma patients they get vaccinated um, annual vaccination with influenza and then as per pneumococcal guidelines um, as per the age and as per the risk factors almost nowadays we have it uh, current guidelines for uh, prevenar where uh, they um, all the age groups can be vaccinated irrespective of either to the age group prescribed was above 60 but not so now okay high high risk individuals uh, like all the asthma patients they they can get vaccinated with pneumococcal and then uh, annual influenza vaccines so Over you mentioned the- you mentioned about two important vaccines that must be given to all asthma patients yes. influenza vaccine every year and pneumococcal vaccine uh, once uh, only once in addition have- to that there are two more vaccines that need to be given i shall come to you yeah. uh the covid vaccine must be given to all asthma patients i think they should not be denied the covid vaccine mm-hmm. at all mm-hmm. and second the, the last one is there is some evidence to suggest that herpes simplex vaccine may be useful the gold guidelines have included that this year uh, as one of the vaccines that you must give to all patients of copd and because asthmatics are also those patients who get inhaled corticosteroids or sometimes even require oral corticosteroids they have a very high prevalence of herpes zoster and therefore you have to give them a booster shot of herpes zoster vaccine influenza pneumococcal herpes and covid are the four vaccines that all your patients must get ajay sorry you wanted to add something i was uh, wondering about the immunotherapy in yes. the pediatric age group because okay. as the question came in pediatric age group it is very difficult to differentiate when the child is between 3 to 10 years of age usually the our pediatrician colleague professionals they treat them and they see so many patients of wheezy child yeah but not always they label as respiratory bronchiolitis and vis-a-vis bronchial asthma they find it very difficult because of lack of diagnostic algorithm and as well as objectivity and some of them also fade away by puberty and that's very the reason i think uh, immunotherapy is something which what is your take dr sandeep on um immunotherapy i mean allergy testing in the pediatric age group so that we can identify and avoid that allergies immunotherapy comes with challenge especially if you have subcutaneous injections uh for immunotherapy then uh, they are not recommended in young children because of the risk of anaphylaxis in adults yes you can use immunotherapy if you have uh, a very specific allergen that is associated with asthma maybe you know only one or two allergens that you have picked up on your skin prick test uh, and the asthma is most certainly always exacerbated or made worse because of these allergens then you can give immunotherapy to these patients but by and large 
do not forget the importance of the standard treatment of inhaled corticosteroids with or without a LABA in these patients. Uh, uh, Ajay, I'm going to come to you. I mean, we were talking, talking about uh, vaccination. And there is some evidence to suggest that giving the influenza vaccine in children who have atopic dermatitis, a family history of asthma, have a family history of atopy, if you give them the influenza vaccine, it prevents the risk of them developing asthma in the future. This is a very new paper that has just been published and very interesting. So we need more evidence to see if that, uh, uh, that is really true. But what are the other factors that you can use in preventing asthma? Preventing the development of asthma and preventing, once you develop the asthma, preventing the exacerbation. So what are your takes on that? See, uh, we all know that asthma is such a variable disease. And uh, it has such a uh, difference because of the socioeconomic uh, and, and the psychology of the patient. So what I feel that uh, these patients, particularly when this chronic inflammatory disease runs in the family, it's very likely that we are going to get uh, some or other history of family members. So I feel that when we take help of those family members' testimonial who are already on inhaled corticosteroid and the proper stepwise management and the results rather than the uh, people who are on uh, celebrity who may come up on the and tell you that this is effective the people among us because anybody will not doubt them because they don't have any vested interest and then people start believing in them believing in them that what are the medication they have used what was their condition before what was their preconceived ideas what was their fear and how did their paradigm got shifted when they continue treatment for sufficient period of time, maybe six months, maybe two years. So I feel that the modifiable factors has to be very carefully taken. The people who are uh, uh, particularly, they are able to find out that these are the causative factors. We need to educate them that they are absolute no for them, whether it is aeroallergen exposure, diesel exhaust, pollution, or whether it is food allergen. I think that is something which we have to educate and also give importance to their own uh, psychology and the ability to cope up and do regular exercise and the role of that. Very well, <laughs> very well said, Ajay. I'm going to come to Dr. Jairavan for the last question that I have. And then after that, I'm going to ask all the three panelists, just what is their last carry home message? One sentence that you would, they, they would like to communicate with the attendees. So Dr. Jairavan, coming to the last question, Asthma, COPD overlap. How commonly do you see that in your practice? And how do you manage these patients? The asthma, COPD overlap. So we are seeing, uh, if you see 100 patients, so 15 to 20 patients comes in the category of uh, ACO, that is asthma, COPD overlap syndrome. So majority of the patients, they started with the asthma management. Slowly, they have a worsening of symptoms, persistent symptoms, persistent airflow limitation, symptomatology, as well as PFT, only function test wise. So these patients, uh, so we label it as asthma, COPD, overlap syndrome. So we treat with the uh, triple drug therapy and uh, the education, proper technique, proper uh, um, adherence, everything we check. So this will be managed the ACO, acute, there is asthma, COPD, overlap syndrome. Sir. Okay, there's one question, Tanmay Maitra from West Bengal. Uh, long, can, when you give Montelicus for a long time, can that cause viral infections? Answer is no. So I think uh, we'll come to uh, the end of this and uh, the last carry home messages that each one of you will have to, uh, which each one of you will have. I'm going to start with Ajay, then Dr. Pramod, and then Dr. Vijay Kumar. Ajay. I think the, just two lines I can say that whenever we see patients of asthma, we should really make the patient partner in the whole management, involve the family member, and help me understand the risk of um, unknowingly uh, getting exposed to exacerbating factors and then take him to a challenging path in next coming three to six months what we are going to achieve and then become partner make the patient partner by giving them some educating material and then uh, help me understand help me understand making, making the patient a partner, partner. in the asthma management uh, spending time with them uh, counseling them, giving them knowledge uh, that will help them improve their asthma uh, control. So thank you very much, Ajay. Uh, Dr. Pramod and then Dr. Jairam and then last word will be Dr. Vijay Kumar. So Dr. Pramod. 
कस्टमर के लिए इनेलर है सही दिस इज द मैसेज शुड बी गोइंग टू लाइक दिस इज ओनली वन लेवल ए एविडेंस प्रैक्टिस टू गेट ओवर अदर मेडिकेशंस आर एज एंड व्हेन रिक्वायर्ड फॉर नोजल ब्लॉकेज लाइक देयर इज समथिंग एक्सप्रेशंस बट व्हेन यू आर नॉट यूजिंग द इनेलर प्रॉपर्ली प्रॉपर रेजिमेन your asthma is not going to get controlled and you will really end up in a many other reservations and lot of complications very well said well done dr jairam yes jairam asthma diagnosis is very very important all that we says is not asthma so the particular history of the nocturnal pattern and the history of allergy in the family history plus the confirmatory test we see and the confirmatory test is pyrometry pyrometry in generally this is under utilized test in overall population so we to confirm the diagnosis and start with the inhaled corticosteroids this is a very very important treatment health education awareness of allergens are very very important wearing mask is very very important smoking cessation is very very important vaccination plays a major role in preventing prevention is better than cure so asthma management mainly the preventing asthma attack you have to wear the mask and awareness of allergens with that i this is my take excellent uh, so before i ask dr vijay kumar to say his final uh, carry home message i would like to express my very sincere thanks to the wonderful panel that we have had they have given such wonderful uh, uh, knowledge to each one of us uh, most of the knowledge came out of their heart came out of their experience and i'm sure that this will benefit a large number of doctors who have listened to this so thank you very much to all the panelists thank you to cci for organizing this very important event on the occasion of the world asthma day and finally to dr vijay kumar for his last carry home message and then he could give the concluding remarks and uh, we can close thank you thank you sir so um, my point is as simple as this so uh, world gina has declared this year theme as closing gaps in asthma care at every point from diagnosis from initiation of treatment and um, uh, starting right treatment patient uh, uh, intake of treatment proper treatment and uh, uh, when to approach uh, when to take self care and when to approach doctors or hospital for care and uh, when to prescribe uh, um, uh, biologicals when to uh, prescribe appropriate medications and more importantly identifying all other comorbid conditions and then giving a holistic approach this is what is lacking these are the various gaps at every point there is a loophole so if we cannot raise it if cca cannot raise to this occasion and uh, under the able leadership of uh, giants like our sandeep salvi sir who else will raise to this occasion i'm sure collectively and um, uh, there there is a saying in telugu okay uh, if we um, put all our um, hand together fingers together to make a fist it will give the power so similarly all pulmonologists mm -hmm. and physicians let's do it and then um, dr sandeep salvi sir has uh, shown the evidence behind the poor care what is the patients are getting as of now so there there are a lot of loopholes so let's close this gaps collectively because if we are united we can do anything um, make it possible nothing is impossible this is possible cca can make it possible and thank you so much one and all uh, uh, my dear sandeep sir pramod sir jairaman and thank you, thank you. Uh, ajay and thank you. wonderful wonderful uh, evening thanks for gracing blessing cci and i would love to extend uh, uh, my uh, heart um, hearty congratulations for cci for doing th this brilliant webinar on this day and also our continuous uh, support is our technical team punit vinod amit and uh, others and i think with this let's um, uh, take uh, very good uh, good evening and bye bye let's catch up in the next webinar soon thank you thank you vijay thank you sandeep sir i wonderfully enjoyed your things are very nice sir thank you good thank night you very much. Much. Thank, you. thank you bye bye